guest this morning is in uh, many ways actually a new name on the scene but a name with a lot of history it's uh, just over a month ago that we saw this company ringing the bell at the New York Stock Exchange to mark the start of GE Vernova so ladies and gentlemen I am delighted to welcome to the stage this morning to properly introduce herself the CEO of GE Vernova's power business please welcome Mavi Zingoni Hey Mavi hi come and take a seat Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. Thank you. And and sort of really the first time that you've been properly in front of all your European customers and colleagues. Yes, as uh, driver over the answer is yes. yes. And uh, I couldn't have introduced the company much better than what you have done right now. I mean, 130, 130 years of history, but we started again. Uh, months and a half ago. Okay, so possibly then a, a good way to say to you then, who are you? Not, not personally who are you, okay. because you've been <laughs> like 24 years in, in, in energy leadership roles, but how do you want this room to view you now? Thank you, and uh, again, good morning, uh, everyone. When you think about G. Varnova, Think about this 130 years of technology history and now building a purpose company very much focused on energy technology. Mm. So when we think about GE Vernova, think about an energy technology company. Um, so we're on our own right now with our own uh, uh, ticker trading in the New York Stock Exchange as, uh, as you mentioned before. We started in uh, April the 2nd. Yep. This uh, new chapter was not the finish line. Actually, it was the starting, uh, the starting line. And think about the company with that heritage, but at the same time, mindset of uh, a startup. Yep. I mean, a fresh mindset with uh, starting, uh, starting again. And, um, and with that, when, when we think about the company and we think about the technologies, think about one-stop shop. Okay. for all the technologies related to power generation, regardless if it is uh, the most conventional power technologies, gas power, hydro, nuclear, um, steam, the net zero wind technologies, I mean, all the both onshore and, and offshore, and especially something that I've been listening in the yeah. previous uh, panel, all those technologies related to the transmission, distribution, and also all the digital that is needed just to orchestrate the grid right now, becoming more and more important. You've, you've brought everything together like that for, for a new future. So if we look at the power division, which you head up, so we've got gas power, nuclear power, hydropower, steam power, all, all together. Um, how do you see that mix changing or evolving as you go forward? You know, you're, you're sitting here now in sort of May 2024, take yourself further ahead by five, ten years, something like that. What is the change that you are anticipating and pushing towards? Yeah, when, when I think about the energy mix, I think that, I mean, the challenge that we have in front of us in this energy transition is so big that when I think about what's the solution for it, the first answer is going to be a combination of technologies. There is not just one technology that is going to take the lead. For sure, you'll have more and more penetration of renewables, but you also need to balance and to back, uh, to back it up. So uh, what we are seeing right now, I mean, this energy transition is the, is the actual super cycle, I was going to say the next uh, super cycle, but, but it's not. I mean, it's the actual one. It's uh, as big as it was the uh, industrialization, electrification, 
in the globalization or, or the first wave of internet. I mean, what we are living right now with more and more demand on the one hand and on the other, we need to make it more and more sustainable. It's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a challenge. So um, when, when I think about it, think about it's not only, I mean, the population increase, yep. that's happening. Also the economic development, I mean, you, Europe probably is different than when you are our web in other, in other regions. But it's also, I mean, these demands of what we listened before, the data centers are the artificial intelligence. Yeah. That is accelerating and changing things a lot. So um, all these data centers right now, I mean, they are very much hungry for power. Mm. Mm. So the world needs power and data, and it is somehow interconnected. So, um, so when you think about the evolution of these uh, technologies, uh, and, and we go one, one by one, say gas power. Gas power is called to be that transition power, but don't think that one dollar invested in gas power is going to be one dollar invested in fossil fuel technology. Think about it is that the transition today, but then you can count on gas power turbines today, but then that can run hydrogen. Even today, 100% hydrogen, we're committed to have 100% of the equipment by the, end of, uh, by the end of the decade. So think about it, there is a pathway, but there are alternatives to decarbonization, not to mention carbon capture attached to it. Yeah, okay, well let's, I know actually that you, you are very keen on those sort of new emerging technologies, um, carbon capture and storage, direct air capture as well, as well. Um, something that you feel very passionately about. Um, you've mentioned them, so I just want to ask you, when do you think we would be sitting here and you would be able to be talking about a fully functioning market, a fully functioning section, segment? Uh, I'm not necessarily talking about a mature market, but something tangible. Yeah. I'd say that when it comes to hydrogen, we are already seeing it. Sure. Uh, when it comes to carbon capture, yeah. I mean, we have first project, I'm sure that you heard about it, the Net Zero uh, design project that is uh, one of the, our most efficient gas turbine, the H-Class, with a carbon capture unit attached to it. So you will have, I mean, a traditional gas power, but with zero carbon footprint. So. I'd say by the, at, by the end of the decade, we will start to see it more and more and more. The technology is, in, is there. The economics, we still need incentives to make it happen or the right, uh, or the right uh, framework. Direct air capture, I'd say we probably need it something for the next decade. I mean, probably second half of next decade. We now have two pilots, one kilo, yeah. one kilo carbon capture from the air. Um, think about one kilo is what we emit, each of us. I mean, uh, Sorry, uh, it's it's exactly. Yeah. So it compensates yeah. one, one person. We have one in the US and, uh, and one pilot in, uh, in Italy, but we are building right now the 10 tons. So we, are, we will be escalating, uh, escalating that with the idea to have the one million ton director capture before the, end of, uh, before the end of the decade. But it's going to take a while. Take a while, okay. Now, you've, uh, everything that you've said is obviously to do with the transition, becoming cleaner, becoming more renewable, changing the mix, sustainability, looking after communities as well, with, uh, I'm imagining pricing is also something that you think about. Um, and we started by saying that you've been in this energy business a long time. Um, you were at COP last yep. year, as, as everyone would expect you, you would be. But do you think the industry is doing enough and doing it quickly enough to get to where we need to be? Uh, short answer is we need to do more. Yeah. We need to do more. And uh, we need to, more, to do more on two fronts. On the one hand, we still have in the world 750 million people with I, I'm not going to say without access to power, but without, without access to reliable power. 750 million people is European population. Mm. So, yes, there, we need to do more in here. And we need to accelerate the, uh, the path at which we are 
decarbonizing. Um, and, and there are many things that we have to do in here, make sure that we evolve in, in the technologies and keep on investing in research and development here, but then make sure that the uh, public, private collaboration, I mean, it's, it's in there as well. With the right framework, I mean, we can do there. One of the things that I was most, probably most impacted of COP was, was, was with that idea of collaboration, in especially in the nuclear sector. Right. So what, what sort of, um, what, what sort of role do you think nuclear will play? I mean, I appreciate that can be a very political question in some areas, but how do you see nuclear evolving? Well, it is uh, for sure. And, um, you know, I think that nuclear is pre and post COP28. You know, COP28, you have this uh, pledge signed by 30 countries. We acknowledgement that it's going to be extremely hard, mm. I mean, to reach net zero by 2050 without nuclear. So this agreement, okay, we need probably three times the current installed capacity of, of nuclear. So it has to change. It has that, to that change. That has to be part of it. It will be interesting to see how that mix evolves and uh, your journey with, as you say, a new company, but one with a lot of history and a legacy as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Mavi Zingoni. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.